back, everybody. We're back with a brand new week, brand new episode of our good old podcast. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are back. We're back. How is the uh, the splint now, Staff? I figured we'd talk about that. Yeah, I'll put it on camera so people can see. It's uh, just a little uh, just half-hand splint, and I'm able to take it off, which is great. I'm allowed to shower <laughs> with it, taking it off, so um, that's huge. And it makes, you know, while I'm still isolating the side of my hand that's broken um, and letting it recover, I'm able to actually perform regular life things again, which is huge. I'm able to actually put my hair in a bun when I want to now. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I can do dishes again, um, but I still am not accessing that side of my hand or this hand in general when it comes to lifting. So my lifts are still very unilaterally uh, focused mm -hmm. in regards to upper body movements. Um, hopefully two more weeks in this and then we're scot-free but yeah broken hands are not anything to uh joke around with though this has been the least entertaining injury i've ever had like mm -hmm. normally i can always find some kind of you know you know diamond in the rough or something like that but the broken hand has been terrible so i am glad that i'm not in a hard cast anymore but even this annoys me sometimes so two weeks cannot come fast enough <laughs> when so you you have to wear that for two weeks yeah i have an appointment on the oh boy what today's the ninth so like the 17th something like that or the okay. 20th something i i don't oh. i forget the exact date but it's it's something like that yeah so like pretty much one full week left and then some time of the week after yeah exactly <clears throat> all right so that's cool yeah and you know getting my hand to not look like a dry piece of mottled skin was also <laughs> something because you know it's been in a hard cast for essentially a month two months almost so mm -hmm. the skin was just super dry and that that took like a three-day process to make it look like it wasn't dead skin um and while that's not relating to lifting it's just an added um discomfort that's that comes with the whole injury yeah yeah i mean you know people talk about the smell and shit after taking off casts and whatnot and mine wasn't I mean, too it, bad actually but yeah. that's because i'm a you know i'm a pretty clean person in general mm -hmm. yeah i mean it can be pretty especially the bigger the cast you know i mean my my brother had one that because he broke like i think it was his arm that was like it was like close to his elbow so he, they had to put him in like the L-shaped cast, so it went past his elbow, so you couldn't bend his arm at all, and that was a pretty big cast. So it went from his hand all the way to like the middle of his like upper arm. Um, yeah. So when I, from what I can remember, it was super long time ago, like five or six years ago. Um, I think maybe even longer. Uh, from what I can remember, it was pretty gnarly when he took it off. He said, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it was, uh, I mean, that's tough. I mean, that one was tough because he couldn't even bend his arm. So um, he could do like the bodybuilder flex, you know, like where you put, yeah. <laughs> I don't even know what to call it, like the the arrow, like, or the bow or whatever the hell it's yeah. called. Yeah. Kind of like a ziz kind of thing. He could do that jokingly, but that's about it. Um, <laughs> what, what was he, were either you or him even into bodybuilding at the time? I feel like five, six nope. years ago, like, yeah, nope. I was, I was going to say. <laughs> no, I mean, it might have been like just like he might have gotten it off probably like just before the start of me getting into the gym, but yeah. that was a start, let alone far enough to even know what it any of it is, you know? So, um, yeah, you, you're saying we're not naturally born with the ziz posed ingrained in us. <laughs> that's uh, your ultrasound. Our ultrasounds yeah. are just us doing the, the ziz pose. <laughs> it's not us kicking, it's. <laughs> Us getting low and doing the Ziz pose. Or it's the, the Michael Hearn memes where <laughs> we're in the womb and there's just baby don't hurt me playing in the Yeah, laid back. <laughs> the one I sent you yesterday was the best one. It's like um when when you find out or you build muscle while you sleep. So I'm so you're so shocking the muscle and he's like he has his eyes closed and he's like inclined benching on Smith. <laughs> shocking the muscle yep. while sleeping. <laughs> That was one of the best ones. I was like, wow, the, the creativity behind that was ridiculous. <laughs> Sir, your total will be $172,382. Me. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Double it to give it to the next person. <laughs> yeah. 
Those memes yeah, have gotten memes. really out of control. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they've gotten real deep. So you're under arrest today, me. No thanks. Have a good day. <laughs> and he's just showing him posing. Baby, don't hurt me. <laughs> yeah. Sir, put like, your hands up. Zizzes. <laughs> yeah. I, I he was doing um it was like put your hands behind your head or something and he's doing like a most muscular. I was like, <laughs> dude, this shit's ridiculously creative. I love it. Like that's so funny. Never even Do, like never could have thought of that. Does he know these memes are are like happening? <laughs> oh yeah, he's got to. He's got to. And speaking of that, actually, I saw a video from Greg Doucette. Apparently, he's doing like some sort of like TRT road or something like 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 uh some sort of like um lifestyle video thing involving trt uh because he's like sponsored by an hrt clinic now uh but he also still says that he's natural he's just he's just explaining what other people go through on trt (laughs) i'm like dude that's i don't understand anymore that that that's (laughs) i don't know what to say anymore (laughs) Yeah, it just doesn't like it, it. I don't know. It's almost like I don't know if it's like delusion or something. But like <laughs> Greg just was talking about it. I, I watched it for a couple of minutes. I couldn't take it anymore because I'm like, this is just absolutely ridiculous. Um, me, me thinking how I look when I pull up to my crush. It's him riding on the horse uh, shirtless. Yeah, legit. Me, me. I'm schizophrenic and I'm in a wheelchair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're all good memes, but um, yeah, that's the newest <laughs> news from him re- recently. Um, that show or movie, whatever the hell he's filming, um, he's got to get like apparently like as dice as he possibly can, and he's fifty four years old. Like, yeah. dude's on tons of shit, but he's like, oh, I don't even take TRT. Like, he's like, what's the point of taking TRT? And Kenny Ko is like, oh, like you can't, or if you know, as you grow older as a man, your 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 test is gonna drop. And he's like, oh, wrong. <laughs> he's like that's just wrong no no like it's like imagine, um, imagine saying just the words wrong to a proven statistic <laughs> yeah yeah it's like trump wrong fake news you're fired yeah you're fired yeah so he was just like no that's wrong he's like that's not true uh so it just it, it just gets deeper deeper but i think of like the donkey from family guy when he's like arguing about who's in a movie and he's like, no, 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 no. He all, he all like, that's what I imagine him being like when people are like trying to tell him he's on, he's on gear. He's like, no, no. He just like starts like, like doing the fucking noise that donkeys make, whatever you want to call it. But well, if he wasn't on gear, then he's got some incredible genetics, which leads us into today's topic. <laughs> Perfect transition. Ways. Yeah, that was that was totally seamless. Um, yeah, we figured just a good uh, a good topic today would be, especially with like the current state of uh, social media, would be like kind of how do you know if you've even reached like your genetic genetic potential? Like, mm. what is it? What does it take? Like, what do you need to look out for? Um, you know, different aspects of genetics that will kind of play a role in being like, yo, you're kind of you're kind of as far as you possibly can get. Uh, and for most people, it's as far as you think, I think, especially if you're not going to be bodybuilding, um, your genetic potential is is way farther than you think, uh, especially the older you get. Uh, the older you get, the stronger you're going to get. Uh, you know, there's dudes who have been natural their whole life and in their 40s and just repping mm-hmm. three plates on a bench just because they've been consistent for 25 years in the gym and they're, they're doing three plates for 10 on bench. You know what I mean? Um, and this jet just dense as fuck muscle, uh, you know, they could stop training for months and it, that shit would still sit. So you never know your genetic potential. Um, and then even if you do reach your genetic potential, maintaining it is, is also another, another ball game as well. I mean, um, most lifestyle people, most lifestyle clients of coaches, um, that's their goal is to get to their genetic potential essentially. And then just kind of maintain from there, uh, which I mean, it's its own complex thing going on. Maintenance is is pretty complex. I mean, people don't really think it is, but it can be definitely. Um, I mean, I'm I'm living proof that that uh, upkeep is is difficult with the broken hand and everything. Just trying to maintain what I have until I get out of the cast. Like I'm walking proof. <laughs> yeah, it's difficult too because you can't train one side really. I mean, your upper yeah. body. 
So it's even harder for you um, to go through that. But yeah, it's interesting because with, with today's social media, so many guys are like, oh, I think I just kind of reached my genetic potential and I want to take like TRT or kind of start on some TRT to gain some more muscle or whatever. And it's like, one, you haven't reached your genetic potential. Um, and two, you're too young. And three, like it doesn't just, you're not just going to start TRT. That's not what's going to happen. Let's be honest. Like you're going to, it's a snowball. It's going to snowball. You're going to, one minute you're taking TRT, you know, you're taking like 150 megs a week or something like that. Uh, injecting into your delts or glutes or whatever it is you're doing. Then all of a sudden, a month later, you're doing your own blasted cycle, you know? So it's like, it, it escalates real fucking fast because people don't take into account, um, you know, the mental side effects of things and the way it makes you feel. Um, for the most part, I've talked about it before. It doesn't really affect me mentally too, too much. Um, there are days that it really gets to me. Um, Friday, it really got to me uh, personally. So my anger was just through the roof and I just yeah. saw red all day, no matter what I did. So like, you never, like, you never know how your body's going to be affected by this shit. So just taking TRT, even though you're like, oh, I'm just going to take TRT and just do that. You, you, your mind on TRT is going to be very different than your mind without it. So, um, you know, you're going to be saying, oh yeah, I'll take it. But then once you're on it, you're going to be feeling good. You're going to be feeling strong. You're going to be feeling like, like, you know, a hundred bucks and then your mind might kind of convince you to be like, yo, let's just hop on like a full cycle. You know, let's, what's the worst that's going to happen. I'm already on TRT. And then you hop on a full cycle of like 500 tests or whatever. And then all of a sudden you start building gyno, you start holding onto water. You feel like shit, your acne goes up. And all of a sudden you're like, well, I don't know what to do now. This is not par for the course. And then you fucked your whole body the rest of your life. Something yeah. to take into account too, is that People talk about like liver king, for instance, to be like, oh, he's natural now. He's not taking anything. Oh you're never, my God. <laughs> yeah. You're never, the second you take anything, you're no longer natural for the rest of your life. Um, I've mentioned it before, but you're never going to be natural again. That's the reality. So if you're going to go down that road, you got to know that. And I think if you go down that road, you should at least know where your genetic potential lies. Um, some people have amazing genetics naturally and are better off without shit. But then there are some people who have terrible genetics naturally and just respond really, really well to anabolics. I'm one of those people. Um, my genetics are garbage. Uh, we went as far as we could with my natural genetics and we're like, all right, it's fine. To, it's time to see, um, what happens if I just hop on a little bit of test and I just, everything clicked, everything clicked for me. I was making gains, losing fat, gaining muscle was just all I needed. So you never know. And knowing when to take that risk is a huge part of the process. Um, obviously, proper guidance is important, but knowing your genetic potential is huge. And 99% of guys who hop on gear don't know their genetic potential. They don't even come close. Um, it's going to take multiple plateaus. It's going to take multiple years to get there, probably like five, six years at least. Um, so the sooner you start, the better. But knowing your genetic potential is, is half the battle, you know, it's, it's, it takes a while. And I think another thing that a lot of people don't factor into the equation when they do start having these conversations about hopping on, <clears throat> whether it's, you know, well, just any anabolic for that matter, is that you have to have your diet and your workout routine dialed in before you should even sniff at considering, mm -hmm. you know, hopping mm -hmm. on anything, because that is a hundred percent part of, you know, maintaining as you go, because, if your diet's whack and you're just eating whatever, like there's nothing for the anabolics to do because you don't have your proper macros flowing through your system. Right. Um, so like whenever I have people that come up to me and ask me, you know, just workout tips in general, like the most common one I get is how do I lose weight? I say, don't even worry about the gym. What's your diet look like? Just, it, it doesn't matter at that point. Like you can mm -hmm. lose all the weight you want strictly from diet and maintaining like a super casual, you know, couple couple cardio a week with like one lifting day a week and just do that if your diet's locked in you'll be losing or gaining um but yeah so when you when people are talking about this whole hopping on gear type conversation they need to have everything locked in before they can even think about you know actually doing it so that's why like right now I'm talking with my coach like we're nowhere near it because I can't lock in the diet like, mm -hmm. even though, you know, workout wise, we were doing pretty well and things were starting to really click. I'm just nowhere near the consistency I need to with my diet. 
Um, so we're just nowhere near that. Um, but granted, I'm still very early on in the process. Like I'm only a year, year. Well, lifting is about three years in now at this point. But with coach, it's about half a year now. Coming up on half a year, I'll say. When did you start again? Wasn't it like October or something? Uh, talking to him then, but I didn't pick him up ja- until January. So right now we're in the fourth month. Yeah. Okay. Um, for me, I was working with a coach previously before my coach now. Um, more just kind of like lifestyle stuff and lifting pretty consistently for a few years. Kind of built a good foundation for form really is what I got out of it. But um, for me, it took, I think it was seven months of strict dieting and really hardcore lifting and cardio before we hopped on anything. Um, yeah. And we only did when I did because – we were at the point where I was like, okay, I feel like I'm not making any gains. I think we kind of like to get to where I want to go. I think we need to start this now. Um, and it was my coach's idea. And he was like, all right, I'm comfortable knowing kind of where your body's at. And I, th- I think that we should just try something to see how your body responds to it. Um, and then uh, it kind of started from there. So it was October. I started with him. And then April was my, I think my first dose of test. Um and now you're on eleven thousand dollars a month, like Liver King is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, eleven thousand of whatever the fuck he was taking, <clears throat> whatever it was, was way overpriced. But um, yeah, no. So uh, now I'm going to be prepping for my first show very, very soon, and should be at the point where it's a matter of who's going to win second. Is kind of like the approach that we're going to take with the show. It's it's not yeah. we're not going to go for the class win. We're going to go for the overall um, is where we're going to be at. So just got to get dialed in. But yeah, so that so to what I was saying was that um, my first cycle was seven months in, and like I said, everything clicked, and I'm blessed to have responded the way that I do um, to anabolics because most people don't really respond that well um, as far as like building muscle, losing fat, all that people respond well, but the, the side effects, um, are going to vary drastically from person to person. Uh, I'm blessed to not have too many side effects. And, and something that also people don't take into account is that some people respond like terrible to anabolics. Um, some guys will be natural and they look amazing. The second they take anabolics, they, their body just deteriorates. Um, you know, you, you never know what's going to happen. And uh, I think more place, more Dave's was talking about it recently. I think he was talking about how, um, you know, there's plenty of cases where you take anabolics and it takes you to the next level and everything clicks. And then there's guys who take anabolics and it's just their entire physique goes to shit. And he's done videos on the, on, on the ladder um, talking about, you know, like horror stories from shit. And, and a lot of the time, What's kind of normalized in social media as well is the harshest shit out there that like most bodybuilders and coaches will be like, yeah, it's really not worth the risk. Uh, One of them is Tren. Um, Obviously, there's jokes out there um, that, you know, Tren is like all you got to take to build, you know, to get fucking crazy. And Tren is probably the one that I see the most memes about. Oh, easily. Yeah, easily. Um, It's just one of them out there. There's dozens of anabolics you can take, but Trend is just one of them. And Trend is like one of the harshest. It's very, very damaging to your liver. Um, It and it really fucks with you mentally. Um, Most guys who are on Trend just like it's it's called. So let me put it this way. The, The another nickname in the community for it is the relationship killer, because when you're taking it, you get extremely paranoid. So whoever you're with, you automatically think they're cheating on you. Like there's no evidence of it or anything. You just have this paranoia like they're che- like she's cheating on me. Like that's the paranoia. And then you also got like the side effects of like thinking that people are out to get you and people are trying to fight you. So you start – a lot of guys on trend will just start random ass fights with people who had nothing – no beef with them. You know what I mean? It's just – the shit that happens and then acting on top of that it's wild like this shit is wild um and so it's usually just not even worth it yeah you get big and you get shredded because it's an alpha 9 nor but on top of taking that you're going to also have to take prolactin or not prolactin um cabergoline to fight your prolactin buildup you're gonna have to take an ai to help fight your estrogen buildup um you're gonna have to take in tons of water um because well you're gonna be holding on to a lot of water as well so i mean it's it's everything anabolic is a double-edged sword you know, on one side, yeah. you got 
the gains you can be making the other side is going to be the side effects. So, um, yeah, trend is just like, like the trend twins, for instance, like I get that the, it's like marketing and they're kind of appealing to different audiences and whatnot, but it's and there's a hundred percent some sponsorships mixed in there. Oh yeah. Yeah. They're making money off it for sure. But it's like, you're, you're promoting one of the harshest, like anabolics out there you know and 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 most guys don't even need to take it you know most guys like could use something else and and every single time i will say this is less is more less is more less is more and that goes for anything you know if you're training way too much and you're not making gains what are you going to do you're going to train more no that's just not feasible less is more, you know, train less, but eat more protein, for instance, you know, if you're doing too much cardio, but not losing the fat you want to lose, then then maybe cut back on the cardio or um, increase the lifting or like, you know, decrease your calories. If you have that, um, you talk to a lot of bodybuilders, the, a lot of the worst phases we go through is recomp phases, because a recomp is recomposition. So we are trying to fix our composition of our body. So that would be like after a bulk, you do like a, like a four week harsh cut to like get your fat down while maintaining muscle. So that, that way you, you get a better overall composition of your physique. And then you start your next phase because you want to start phases with, with a, with a clean slate essentially. So, you know, people will be doing the same thing for four or five years and hitting all these plateaus and shit. And it's like, dude, you're, you're really pushing your body. You're eating too much. You're training too much. It's just, you need to kind of take a step back and, and reevaluate. And that's what these recomps are for. So, um, you know, less is more and, you know, you don't want to overdo it if you're trying to go for a specific goal, you know, so you got to really evaluate that. And that's why coach comes into play. I well, think. it's like when you, you can compare it to like a computer. So like, if you have a computer program, that's not running, like, let's say it, it works and then it just like stops working, you reset your computer like <laughs> there's <Yeah. laughs> or you restart the computer or you like uninstall the program and then reinstall it or something like that you but you make a change is the point being and <clears throat> that's the point that paul's making here is that like when you're hitting these plateaus or just not seeing the gains that you want to see in the gym you have to change it you can't just hold on to the mentality that if i continue to push through this something will change like and like you said, the, having the coach does help. Like an example I'll throw out there is like when everything went down with my hand, I texted. He was one of the first people I texted. And I, was, I just told him everything. And he said, mm -hmm. all right, let's take the like rest on it tonight. And we're going to reevaluate everything tomorrow. And yeah. by the morning when I hit him up, he had an entire plan for like how I was going to maintain, uh, how I was going to continue to grow like legs specifically because legs I can still crush right now. And we adapted to the situation. And, you know, if you're in a situation where you've been working out for like a year and you're not seeing any or you're not seeing the changes that you want to see at that point in your lifting career, talk to someone in the professional field and have them give you that little bit of insight or pick up a full time coach and have them just dial it in with you because they will make the changes um, mm -hmm. and you need to. You should be making changes anyways, even if you're not plateauing, just because that's how we stay, you know, on our toes in the gym, because so many of us fall into the routine of, okay, it's Monday, this is what I'm doing, I'm going to do the exact same exercises and everything. Um, I think, Paul, you, you made a post about it. Uh, if you go into leg day and don't do something different every day, you failed your leg day or something like that. It was, um, if you don't, if you go into your leg day and don't do what you don't want to do you failed. Yeah. So I always go into my leg day doing what I don't want to do. I'll look at the machinery and I'm like, that sucks. And I'm like, fuck, <laughs> now I gotta do it. Like that's, that's my mindset. It's like, you like consistency is key. Absolutely. I think that like for that example, what I mean is like, I'll go into the gym and I'll be like, I like I, every single leg day I have basically the same structure. It's some sort of like leg curl to warm up my hams. And then I go into some sort of squat that's quad focused. Then I go into some sort of like press that's glute focused. Then I go into some sort of straight day, straight leg deadlift or, or like a, like a banded squat, uh, for hams again. And then I go into a leg extension. So there's always some sort of similarity from each leg day, but sometimes I'll do like a hack squat. If I don't feel like doing that, then I'll, or I'll like, if I don't feel like putting the weight on my back, I'll do a barbell squat. 
you know, whatever I don't feel like doing is what I end up doing uh, yeah. for that variation of that movement. So consistency is going to be very, very key for reaching your uh, genetic potential, but you need to take into account that like change is good. You know, change is going to shock your body. Um, you don't want too often of change. You want to be lifting differently every single time you lift. Uh, right now, pretty much every single workout I do is just about the same besides leg day. Um, but I'm going to do that until probably when I'm off this cycle and moving on to the next, and then I'll change it up. Um, so, you know, you got to find what works for you. And like, we keep saying like consistency, 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 but also knowing when to change something is also part of consistency. Like when you know, like, okay, I've been doing this long enough now, my body's going to start kind of like plateauing a little bit. When you start hitting that, you need to know like what you're looking out for. You know, you need to know your body at that point and then you can start changing things. So um, that was kind of me switching gyms. That's why I was excited to switch gyms a couple months ago was like, I can start changing things up again. Um, so you need to know that as well. Your food's got to be consistent. Everything's got to be consistent. Uh, and then making minor tweaks here and there, depending on what your body needs. And another misconception, especially if you're newer, is when you're going for lifestyle, bodybuilding, whatever it is, um, a lot of people think that when you're bulking versus when you're cutting is going to be two different meal plans completely. It's not the reality. When you're bulking, when you're cutting or in a recomp, you're really having the same food as usual, just different it's quantities. It's just less or it. more. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's just different quantities. And like when people say um, another, even another aspect to that is like when you enter prep, it's not like you're 4,000 calories and then all of a sudden you're 2,000 calories when you start prep. It's like you're 4,000 calories and then you're like 3,800. You know, it's like yep. you just barely lower it or like you don't even a lot of bodybuilders don't even know when they're fully in prep. And then the coach would be like, oh, yeah, you've been in it for three weeks. It's like prep isn't really what people think it is. It's not. I mean, depending on the bodybuilder, like somebody like Lee Priest. Yes, he needs to know when his prep starts because he put on so much fat in between shows because he would bulk so much to put on the muscle to start his prep. He needed to start way out and he needed to do it harsh as fuck to lose all the water and fat he put on. But yeah. that's a rare case. Uh, typically, people's bodies don't agree with that. Um, so for like lifestyle, right? Um, what you're going to see a lot is people wanting to look good for like the beach in the summer or something like that. So let's say we're talking about New England because I know we got a lot of US listeners, but also a lot of UK listeners too, which is kind of similar to New England weather. So let's say we're talking about, you know, your, except, your we're, except we're the newer and better England. <laughs> Yeah, we, we won in 1776. Sorry, England. <laughs> That's why we're able to put the new in front of England up there in the Northeast. <laughs> um, but so let's say we're talking about that, for instance. Um, when New England's summer, it's like really the warm months are like June, like beginning, May, May, end of May, beginning of June to like end of August, beginning of September. That's really when it's warm. Uh, mm -hmm. September, it starts kind of dipping down a bit. And then October, it's officially like cold. You're not going to go to the <laughs> beach in October, really, unless it's like a fluke day. But let's say we're talking about New England. So you, let's say you really got like three months. Let's just say you have three months out of the year to be like, this is when I want my beach body to look good. So let's say you want to be, you want to look good starting June, right? So what you're going to want to do is you want to time it properly. So it, it's going to, once you, once you, are able to figure out your time frame. You can obviously adapt it, but basically what you want to do is let's say you're just going for a lifestyle and you're like, all right, I just want to, you know, feel comfortable in some board shorts or whatever, or maybe a little bit of visible abs or something, maybe some vascularity, whatever it is. Um, so we, what you're going to want to do is really probably like maybe March potentially kind of start like weaning down on the calories uh, so that you can move your way into June. But the thing is, is you don't want to be like, you don't want to be going so harsh on your body that cutting is going to be like very, very difficult. You know, you don't want to be already so low calorie that like to cut is going to be hard or like doing already tons of cardio. So you should really be introducing cardio probably like that March, for instance, um, to lose weight. Cardio is good for overall health, but to introduce cardio to help lose some fat, um, most likely March, do it a half hour, maybe four or five times a week. Um, going into obviously all the way down to June, you shouldn't really need to change your cardio up that much. And then just every week, 
maybe drop like 50 ish calories. If you're, let's say you're at like 30,000, like 3000 calories, 30,000 calories, Jesus, 3000 hmm. calories, uh, you know, dropping maybe 50 calories a week or something like that, or like a hundred calories a week. If you really wanted to go or actually wait, so we got 12 weeks. Yeah. So do like 150 calories a week, maybe 200 calories a week, actually not 200, maybe like a hundred, 150, um, depending on your body, obviously it depends on where you're at, but really you want to get down to probably about 2000 calories a week or sorry, a day. Um, by the time June a week, rolls my God, <laughs> yeah, a week, um, 2000 calories a day by the time June rolls around for most guys in the gym, that's going to be a pretty harsh cut. Like you're going to be kind of depleted at that point. Um, but then when June rolls around and you're ready to start going to the beach and feeling good about your body in the summer, that's when you just start maintaining. Basically, you should probably be taking in maybe like give or take 2750 to 3000 calories, depending on your weight and all that. And then maybe introducing some, you know, restaurant meals here and there, you know, maintenance is going to be much easier than a cut, but, um, maintaining that and still training during the summer is going to be important. And then when the summer is over, that's when you do kind of like a recomp. You kind of give your body a couple of weeks rest. Maybe don't train in the gym. Eat kind of eat not necessarily whatever you want, but eat healthy. Um, you don't have to eat really your meal plan. And then that's when you kind of do like a slight bulk after that, you know, maybe two, 300 calorie surplus bulk, um, putting on some weight and then you start your cut again in March. So that's typically what like, like a lifestyle kind of meal plan training style would look like uh obviously bodybuilding is a whole nother ball game because we want to be as low body fat percentage as we can for one day um so it's a different it's a different world but for a lifestyle that's what you're kind of looking at so to understand like what your body responds to to look the best it can in summer uh is going to be key and that's where consistency comes in um you know if your body responds better to sweet potato than uh i don't know russet potato then you do that. If your body responds better to white rice versus brown rice, do that. Your body responds to white meat better than red meat, do that. If your body doesn't like beef, but it likes bison, do that. You know, so like all these consistency things, there's consistency things are going to play a role going into this lifestyle cycle, essentially of food and training. So something to keep in mind because everybody kind of neglects like, you know, oh, I want to drop all this weight in two months for the beach. And it's like, that's not really the way you should be doing it. And we see it every year on Facebook, Instagram, whatever. Everybody's doing this like really hard cut and going to the gym a lot. People who don't go to the gym, go to the gym a lot all of a sudden. And then, you know, everybody's like trying to eat as healthy, the, healthy as they can. And it's just not, it's not sustainable. You know, you, you can't just go cold turkey on life like that. So. Well, that's consistent. why people, that's why the the new year new year's resolution is such a popular thing because that's january and that's about six months or five months out from when you want to be looking as diced as you can so that's i mean obviously the new year resolution happens and that's a big reason why too but the reason why is you know some people will stick it out from that is because you know you're building up into those what are called the fun months basically where you get to you know be outside and be looking as good as you can. Um, and you heard Paul say like, uh, how your body reacts to certain things. You won't know how your body reacts to certain things unless you have that consistency. That's a big thing to note too. Like you can't like you, you need to eat this, you know, your meal plan for probably a good month before you can start to really understand if your body is reacting well or not to it. Um, like for me, Something that I used to do prior to having a coach is that my Saturdays would be just eat everything and anything I could find. And it was a dirty eat kind of day too. So I would eat like, you know, fast food and Domino's and stuff like that. And uh, I have not, I hadn't eaten it ever since I picked up my coach. And then about a couple of weeks back, I went and I ate Domino's and my body completely rejected it. Like I felt sick. I was on the bathroom for, (laughs) I was in the bathroom for a good hour after the fact. And my body just flushed it out right away because it was like, this is not what we want. And that's the kind of reaction you're, you will get when you find um, foods that you either enjoy or don't enjoy. Like, uh, mm-hmm. your, your body will, you know, more or less attuned to the foods that it wants to. So that's why you need to get the consistency before you can even make those decisions. Like if you just say, Oh, I don't like this food because you don't like it. But in reality, it's probably the best thing for your body and your body would react really well to it. You just have to fight through it. Like you, 
eating things you don't enjoy eating for the results is kind of what gym matur- maturity will look like <laughs> because yeah. you you accept the fact that you want to achieve these particular you know gains whether it's lifestyle or bodybuilding and you just eat whatever it is that you need to be eating not what you want to be eating uh, and that's right, kind of a right. big part of it yeah i mean it's it's tough i mean it, it you know you can make your food taste good um, and sometimes you can kind of tweak out food that you, you don't like, uh, you know, if you, you know, if you don't like broccoli, but you like spinach or something like you can do it that way. But, uh, for me, it's like, I can't stand sweet potato. So like, that's a hard one for me. Um, I like it when you douse it in butter and cinnamon and shit, like making it really sweet, but like outside that or make it like fries, like sweet potato fries are good, but like just regular straight sweet potato, it's just not really for me. Um, I just don't really like it. So it's like, there are things you can kind of tweak a little bit if you work with your coach, but, uh, for the most part, a lot of food that our bodies respond well to isn't exactly the tastiest, uh, which kind of sucks, but it's just the world that we live in. You know, it's, it's, we're so, we're so accustomed to eating food that tastes good. If you get to the point where like, like anybody talk to any, any bodybuilder who's ever been on a harsh cut, like c did a video about it. Like he would put, if he has like mustard on his food towards like the end of his cut, like for, or the end of his prep for a show, he talks about how amazing it tastes. He's like, this tastes so, so good. It's because he's so used to like plain ass food that putting on a sauce like that, it's just next level. But it's because we're so used to all these different flavors and seasonings all the time that eating something plain and boring or just not tasting good as usual tastes like shit. And it's just, you got to get to... You got to get it down to a point where your body doesn't crave as much stuff as it normally does. You know, candy and chocolate's my hardest thing. It's what I crave all the time. But to get off that craving, you just just can't have it. You know, you got to get over the three day hump, essentially, of craving foods, and then you get there. But it's tough, man. It's hard. But getting that consistency in there is what's going to separate you. Um, I think candy is the the toughest one for every single person because. Everybody eats so much sugar in their regular day. Like, well, when I say everybody, I mean people who don't have their diets locked in eat right. sugar so much in an in like a given day that candy doesn't even like real like most people don't even realize how much sugar is in that. Or same like with uh, regular sodas, like they're not realizing how much sugar they're intaking. Mm-hmm. So when we say like cut out all sugar, like in theory, that's such an easy thing to say. But for some people, it is so tough because they don't even realize how much they're intaking. Like people need to realize how much is in like a can of Coke. <laughs> yeah, it's insane. Like, it is wild. <laughs> yeah, I um, I sat down to eat the other day and I, I drink some Coke Zero here and there. I have like these bottles um, of it. And whenever I feel like having one, I'll have it. It's not often. It's like every like four or five days, I'll have a Coke Zero. But when I want one, I really, really want one. So yeah. I sit down, I grab one, I start drinking it. I'm like a few sips in and I sit down on the couch after I'm done eating. And my wife's like, are you my, are you drinking my Coke? I look and I'm like, it was the regular Coke. It wasn't a Coke. Oh, no. Like, no wonder why I felt so good. Like literally one <laughs> sip and I'm like, oh, like it felt so <laughs> good. Like it just, what, like it yep. just like washed everything away. It was the weirdest feeling. I thought it was just because like it tasted really good. So it's like, this is, this is great. But then I was like, oh, it's the corn syrup in there that like makes you feel that way. Yep. It's, it sucks um, that it's like that, but it's easier to hit like, like a salt craving. It's really easy to get that in. Like I have pickles. Like anytime I feel like having chips or something, I'll just have a pickle and it's like, oh, this shit's so good. Like I love pickles. I could crush a jar in a day like no problem and that's more or less my go-to calories. snack yeah that's i just i keep a jar of pickles in the in the fridge and that's like when i just want like just a little something i just eat one like I, i'm in yeah. agreement with you pickles are are a top tier move <laughs> yeah they're so good they're so so good and if you put them on like a like a sandwich or something, it just takes it to the next level. But you can um, tell where you can tell where two people invest in the gym world because here we are talking about pickles. <laughs> yeah, or like or like um, <laughs> you get like because we get this like this like healthy popcorn right that comes in a bag, and if you have like a couple pieces of that with like the sea salt on it, it's like oh oh, it's like <laughs> it's so good. But that shit's so addicting. Um, but yeah, when it comes to sweets, it's, it's really hard to hit that. That's why, like, I drink a lot of, like, uh, energy drinks and stuff because it's sweet. And it kind of tides over that that itch. 
Um, I was working yesterday for a couple hours and like I was itching to have something sweet. You know, it was just like, it's literally like a craving. It's like, it's like your body has withdrawals when you have, when you don't have something sweet, at least for me. So like just going and getting like a zero calorie energy drink or something and just sipping that, like it'll last me four or five hours, but just having something to sip on whenever I have that craving for something sweet, well, it, it's just, it's just amazing, but it's, it's hard. It sucks. Um, when you're bulking is different, uh, cause sometimes you can kind of get away with certain things or, you know, have a refeed here and there. Um, there are points where at least for me, it didn't, it didn't last that long, but, um, being able to have a weekly refeed, um, that's hard. Um, or that's great. I mean, it's hard to get there where you can have a weekly refeed and afford it, but, um, it's not often that I'm able to do that. Uh, but I mean, it is what it is. And, and now we're getting to the point where I'm starting to get ready for a show. And, and I think I'm kind of, I think I'm, I'm going to be ready for my prep when I do start it because, um, I'm ready to get diced. I've never really gotten super, super diced. So um, I'm ready to see what my actual muscular physique looks like. And I'm ready to lose yeah. this baby fat. So I'm ready to push it. Uh, it's just going to suck because I got a week trip in Florida in June. So I'm going to be in, in prep during that. And everybody knows <laughs> that. Who's going? I'm like, guys, I'm going to be in prep. I literally cannot eat anything out. Like I'm going to have to eat everything I pack. Um, obviously down there, I'm going to have to also cook as well cook my meal plan and shit but um i'm gonna try to pack what i can i'm, I'm yeah. considering because they're gonna be driving so i'm considering packing a bunch of my meals and putting it in a um cooler like i did last year or a couple of years ago and throwing it in their car for them to drive down um to florida for me um so that well a lot hoping- a lot of what we eat during a day you can like just eat cold too, like out of a cooler, like hypothetically, yeah. like chicken and rice, you can pound that cold. Like there's yeah. no problem with that. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm, it's just, it's just more so like it lasting the trip down there because it's like a nine and a half, 10 hour drive. So yeah, you got a good enough cool, like just throw a bag of ice in there. You'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to, I'm probably going to get like a cheap foam cooler or something like that and just yeah try to prep as much as I can. Um, if not the whole week or more, um, what I, what I'm going to try to do, I think we're going to be down there for six or seven days. So I'm going to try to do is get like eight or nine days prepped. Um, so I have extra just in case something happens, um, where I spill it or something like that. I can grab another, but, um, that's a plan right now. Uh, so it's going to be, it's going to be hard. It's going to suck, you know, being in Florida and being on prep and stuff, but also at the same time, I feel like I'm, I'm hoping to be at the point where I feel good about how I look, you know, which is going to be hopefully where I'm at. But we'll see. Yeah. That's going to take some time. And all of that kind of, you know, everything we've talked about over the past, you know, half hour. Or so that all builds up into what you can try and achieve naturally because you have to, when when even thinking about that conversation of gear, you have to have, have this conversation that we've had just now about all your dieting needs, your mm-hmm. workout routine and everything. And um like Paul said way earlier on, like a lot of people just get frustrated and that's when they start talking about hopping on gear, which is the dumbest thing that you can do. Like getting frustrated, is just a part of the gym. Like we train, we literally train to failure or you should train to failure every single day. So you should be getting frustrated. And so when you even start thinking about talking about gear or anything like that, it shouldn't be out of frustration. It should be out of a natural point. Um, and this is me just kind of bringing it back to the conversation. But uh, what was it like for you when you <clears throat> were, because I know you probably had it in your mind well before your coach brought it up. So what was it like mm-hmm. balancing either resisting asking about it, asking about it or like dropping hints or was there anything that went into that? Because I know for sure you had been thinking about it prior to him bringing it up. Yeah. So, well, I, st- I talked to him originally and, um, you know, he's, he was at the point and still is today where he, my coach will only work with people he wants to work with. Um, so he had to kind of vet me. He had to, you know, we had like a, I forget what it's called. A, um, basically like a phone call where we see where we both sit and what I'm willing to do and, you know, what he's willing to put into it, stuff like that. Um, a consultation kind of basically. Um, 
and kind of see where we're at. And that was kind of where the expectations were set on both of us. I was like, you know, I'm willing to do what it takes and I want to get to pro and I'd love to be able to live off it or at least have it pay for itself. Um, and I know that that's going to take anabolics and I'm okay with that. Um, and I kind of, you know, I was like, the, really the biggest thing for me is I don't want to be taking a ton of years off my life. And I also want to be able to have kids one day and, you know, knowing what I know now, it's, it's not a problem having kids one day. Um, cause sometimes people there's, there is a kind of like, I guess, viewpoint behind anabolics that you can't have kids once you hop on stuff, but that's not the reality. Uh, you can do pulse psychotherapy and get off anabolics and all, and your, your test is going to be producing just as normal. Um, when you're on anabolics, it's, it's very hard to have kids because you're, you're, testes are shut down. So you're not really producing really any sperm, honestly. Um, so it's, it's difficult to have kids while you're on shit, but during PCT when you're off, it's fine. So I know that now, but at the time I didn't. So I was like, you know, as long as I can have kids, I don't want to take too many years off my life. I want to live, you know, a pretty long life if I can. Um, and, uh, you know, I want to be healthy with it too. I think health is, is very important. I don't want to kill myself with it. And, he was kind of in the same boat and I was like, you know, I know this is a marathon, not a sprint. I know it's going to, it's, there's not going to be, you know, instant gratification. I know there's just going to be times where I don't like my physique or I'm going to feel weak or tired or whatever. And I'm okay with that. You know, it sucks, but it, it's part of the game. And, you know, he agreed and, you know, he's, he kind of set the expectations. And then um, we're like, I think we did like a pretty harsh cut. Like we wrote, really wanted to trim the fat down. So I lost like 20 pounds over like four or five months um, while gaining some muscle and whatnot. And then it was like March or April, I think of 21. And he was like, um, he was like, all right, when you're ready to take it to the next level, I think we're in a good place to do it. So he said, let me know when you're ready. Um, and we'll figure it out. So at the time I was paying him essentially half what he normally charged at the time he charges more now because of how sought after he is as a coach. But, um, I was paying him half that and doing way in every two weeks. Um, but then when we were going to hop on anabolics, instead of paying the full price, he charged me a little bit less so that I could put that money towards anabolics. He said, you know, we're going to be working together for a while. So money is not really, is not really a topic for me. He's like, you're, we're not doing like a prep and then we're done. You know, it's, we're, we're going to be, you and I are going to be working for years. So, um, just pay me this. So you can put this amount towards anabolics. Um, and he said, let's, let's, you know, let's, let's get on this and this and, um, see how your body responds to it. It's like, all right, cool. Found a source to get it, got it, started it and responded really well. Um, so it was, it wasn't really something that like we talked about too much, um, during that kind of like cutting phase from October to April. Um, it was just kind of like in the back of our minds, I think it definitely in the back of my mind was like, eventually this is going to happen when it does. I have no idea. Um, I didn't think it was going to happen for another year or two. Like I thought I was going to be with him for a while before I even touched anything. But then we were at a place where I was like, he knew kind of genetically where I sat and was like, all right, let's give this a shot. And it was a really good first cycle. Um, we, it was four weeks of 400 milligrams of test. And then we I think we went up to 500 milligrams after four weeks and introduced Enovar and then ran that for about 12 weeks. And then we did a PCT after that. Um, so it was a really good first cycle, really, really good first cycle. And, and that's the thing with first cycles too, is that like, it, it's like newbie gains all over again. Your first cycle is going to be the best cycle you ever have, no matter what you take. So you don't want to be taking too much shit. Like that's the other thing too, with like social media is like all these guys are taking tons of trend, tons of tests, tons of, tons of fucking, I don't even know all at the same time. And you don't need to be taking that. Like your body's going to respond so heavily to your first cycle that less is more. And if you take so much shit for your first cycle, you're going to have to take even more in the future. And yep. that's going to be very, very difficult. Uh, so we, we started off at a good place and we, we found what my body responded to well, um, which was DHTs, which is Anavar, which is a, um, DHT is a derivative of testosterone, essentially. Um, testosterone is essentially the building block of all anabolic anabolics, essentially. If you want to look at it that way, it's a tree trunk and then all the different anabolic kind of stem from it. But, um, Anavar is a DHT and then we, I, I respond very, very well to testosterone, um, uh, in general, which is the, which is pretty much the base of most cycles. So it, for me, it was, it wasn't. 
it wasn't something I was really trying to push to get on, but it was kind of like, I, I know that this is what I'm going to need to do and yeah. I'm okay with it. And like in one way, it's awesome. You know, I love taking shit, but also at the same time, it's like, it kind of sucks too, because like you're, you get so used to the extreme side of feeling things like you, you, you get used to the gains, you get used to the changes and you get, to, you get used to how like you feel during it that when you're off it, you feel like shit, but we don't feel like shit. We feel normal. You know, like this is how we're supposed to feel normally. But to us, we feel like shit because we're so used to feeling amazing all the time that when we're not on shit, it's like, damn, this sucks, you know? So it's something to, something to take into account is that not only are you going to be affected mentally on it, you're going to be affected mentally off it. Um, so, and, and coming off shit is also depressing as well. It's like, I got genuinely depressed coming off Anovar because it actually affects your dopamine sensors. Um, so you have more dopamine when you're taking something like Anovar or Primo or any sort of DHT because it actually affects that, that the happy, the happy part of your brain. When you get off it, you, you kind of get depressed because you have to get back to where you are naturally, your baseline. So yeah. it's, it's, it's not easy, man. It sucks. But um, it's not something you should be taking lightly. It's not something to joke about. Um, and, you know, kids will lo- ruin the rest of their lives taking shit because you know they'll shut everything down without knowing what they're doing and you know determining okay i think this is what's best for my first cycle without knowing that and they'll start that shit six months into gym and it's like dude you didn't even you didn't even know what you're capable of like like i had three years of really consistent training and even probably longer than that before i even touched anabolics and we went pretty far food wise before i even touched anything like these kids will get in the gym and three months in, start shit. I'm like, dude, you have no idea what the fuck you're doing. Like, you still have newbie gains. Like, you're literally, <laughs> like, if it's your first year actually lifting, no shit. Like, this is, I'm not even lying when I tell you this. You're actually making borderline anabolic results your first year, which is newbie gains. My first year, I gained eight and a half pounds roughly of lean muscle tissue. That was my first year. That's like, on average, that would be a great year for muscle gain. That's a great year, even on yep. anabolics. Like that's a solid ass year of muscle building. And it, I hope for that now. If I gained eight, nine pounds of muscle each year, by the time I'm 30, I'm going to be fucking massive, dude. <laughs> like like that's the reality. So your first year is crucial. And the first year you should be natural 100%. That's my opinion. And newbie gains, you really need to capitalize on. Just, just don't train to the point where you're going to damage your joints. But train effectively and efficiently as best you can. Uh, it's very easy to damage your joints in your first year because you're going to get really strong, really fast, and you're going to feel overly confident. I hurt my knees. I know someone who's had a surgery on each knee because of his squatting issues. So, you know, take it easy, uh, but also train effectively and efficiently because you're going to have newbie gains. You want to capitalize on that. It's wild, man. You should, yeah, no. I I fucking hate hearing anybody who hops on gear within the first year of training. Like, it's so dumb. Well, that's why it's it sucks with a lot of the social media and the fitness influencers that you see because so many of them will, you know, promote that kind of stuff. And if they're not promoting it, they're promoting the I'm natural when they're clearly not. So it's like there's no middle ground right now in terms of influencers. There's either, you know, do this or you won't reach your gains or there's I've done nothing and if you take these couple, you know, sponsored supplements, you will get where I am when it's clear that, you know, you're on an intense cycle doing all sorts of different stuff. Like, I mean, we mentioned him kind of earlier, but the Mike O'Hearn stuff where Mr. Mr. Natural is, is you know, his nickname because he claims to be full-time natty, but <clears throat> he clearly is <laughs> is not. Um, and on the other side of things, like Paul mentioned the trend twins earlier, like they're pushing that product so hard, trying to get you to take that particular, you know, anab- anabolic and that makes it so there's no middle ground. People don't want to do, you know, the hard work in the lifestyle side of things. They just want to hop on something or buy whatever sponsored products there are. There's no middle ground anymore. And, you know, I, I don't think that's what the goal of social media was, but it's become such a such a polarizing um, environment now that there's no way for people to balance that. And not everybody wants to do their own research either. They are totally fine with taking a look at what is available for them and just doing baseline research. 
Like if everybody did, you know, a podcast, for example, they would have to do the research. They have to go in and do additional reading. Like you have to do work. And that's what goes into this, like what Paul and I do mm -hmm. here. And if everybody did that, and even if you weren't running a podcast, but if you were just doing that for your own self interest, like before you took gear or something like that, that's what you kind of have to get into the rhythm of doing because it's a very, very dangerous world if you don't. Yeah. And, and something else to take into account too is um, like, I'm reading this Reddit thread right now about trend twins. I'm not really reading it, just skimming it while you're talking, um, talking about what their cycles, what their cycle is. And they've been taking shit for a while. Apparently they've been lifting for eight years. I don't know how old they are, but Who like are these? the trend twins, uh, I don't really okay. know anything about them. I just know that they exist. Um, you could tell just based off their nipples that they have estrogen in their system. Like it's, it's, it's clear. Um, but, uh, they're five, seven supposedly each. So it's like, these guys look crazy in their photos and videos, but they're five, seven. And <laughs> like, there's also this joke that like guys who like breathe Jim air who are five, five and they end up fucking huge. But like, it's the reality. Like when you put on a pound of muscle at five, seven, it's way more than a pound of yep. muscle at six foot. So you got to take into account your height as well, because videos and social media is very very deceiving when it comes to height and it fucking kills you like you know you see some giant ass dudes in social media and then you see them in person and they're like half the size you thought they were because they're or on the other really side like brian shaw and, and eddie hall like they don't look like mammoths in their you know in their videos because yeah. they're with each other but then at the o when brian shaw handed the the o winners yeah. their medals he was like twice their height and their size yeah he's <laughs> enormous yeah he's six nine or six ten four hundred something pounds so he's a gigantic yeah. dude um but like the like it, it's just there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that people don't take into account and posing is is one of them um you know, I see guys all the time, you know, looking good in poses and stuff. But then the second they, they drop their pose, it's like all of it just fades away. Um, and that's the point of posing is it's it's supposed to make you look as good as possible. But you're you posing in perfect lighting with a pump and with edited filters and with the proper camera placement is not how you're going to look naturally walking around the fucking mall uh, in a January <laughs> during the day. Like it, it's just the reality. And um that's why like, you know, you, you don't judge someone based off how they look in the gym with photos and shit. You should judge them based off how they look in person. Like I want to look like a bodybuilder in person on a regular ass day, like just walking around. Um, but some people just want to have that, you know, Instagram build. And that's kind of what the trend twins have. Um, and you got to take into account. Another thing too, is that if you want a bodybuild, almost never does a stage look or like going for a stage look translate also to a social media look. Um, you know, you got to either pick one or the other. You got to have, you got to want to either have an amazing social media look or an amazing stage look. And there's really no in between. Um, typically there's no in between. I mean, when you're talking about like the Olympia competitors, obviously they can do both, but for the, for most people, you can't have an, a great Instagram look and then go decimate the stage. It's usually one or the other. Uh, and, and another thing, like if for, for the social media, like influencers, like unless they're a freak of nature, like Joe aesthetics or someone like that, the look that they're posting, even though they're posting year round, they were probably taken within a span of like three months of each other. Yeah. And th that's, what's getting posted year round. So that's another thing that people don't seem to realize they did the, you know, someone will post, a picture or video and they'll be like wow that's what they look like now and in reality that video was taken you know six months ago when they were in a like a like a deep cut or something like that obviously yeah. there's you know outliers like we that guy joe aesthetics he posts year round and he actually looks like that year round which is wild i mean he hasn't he hasn't had any success on stage because he can't pose but what he posts online is how he looks year round um which is absolutely wild yeah, like looking at his Instagram right now, like he looks nuts in his photos, but then you see his stage shots and it's like, yeah, he, he just lost. can't pose. He can't pose. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what his comes down to. His most recent stage, like he looked, he looks lean as hell, but he just doesn't have the stage build. He just, he hasn't focused on it. His, his waist is really wide. 
uh, for men's physique, especially, and his arms are on the smaller side for what you're going to want. I also think his abs are a little washed out on stage compared to his Instagram videos yes. and pictures. He, he very heavily edits his photos and videos with filters and shit. Um, yep. Especially his videos. People don't realize it, but like his videos are very, very heavily filtered um, and make him look way gnarlier than he is. Which, I mean, he looks phenomenal. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying he looks yeah. bad. I'm saying it's just, it takes his look to the next level just by putting on filters and shit. Um, but like, that's why, that's why I say you got to have either a social media build or, or a bodybuilding build because on stage, there are no filters. There are no edits. Like you got to, and you're being compared to other people directly next to you. It's a different world. You know, you can't, it, it almost never translates. Um, and that's why like, there are some guys who look better on social media than like, Sebum does you know but like the second they got on stage he just absolutely fucking rocks their shit you yeah. know um it's like urs like urs looks fucking crazy in his photos and videos um it looks lean as shit just vascularity all the way but then he steps on stage and Sebum just decimates him because he just Sebum just has a better stage look uh urs looks amazing he's one of my favorite looks up there but um it's just on social media i would pick urs over Sebum, but then on stage, obviously Sebum destroys him. Um, yeah. But yeah, so getting back to like genetic potential, like this is just something you got to take into account because like just because, you know, these guys look great on social media doesn't mean that they look that great in person. Um, and you're going to go through phases where you don't look the best. You know, you're going to go through phases where you put on fat, you're going to lose your vascularity, you're going to not feel the best or feel like you look the best in mirrors. And then there's going to be the opposite. And and the other thing too is body dysmorphia is a bitch. And you talk to anybody who's been really, really lean, even when they're very lean, they still feel like they could be better, which sucks. It's like, you know, there's guys I've seen posts on Instagram. They're like three, four days out from a show and they like look back at that and they're like, damn, I wish I just enjoyed where I was because I look crazy here. And at the time he, they're like, oh, but at the time I felt that I looked fat and I was holding onto water and I was just unhappy with my look. And it's like, if you really take a step back and look, it's like, dude, you look fucking crazy. Like you, <laughs> you need to admit that, you know? So that's, it's tough. It's tough because you're never going to be, most guys are never going to be happy with how they look. You know, you have to, it takes a lot of dedication to get to that point. Um, but then, but then like with social media, especially, you're not going to like how you look, but then when you go to in person, like when you're at the beach or something, uh, you're going to, you're starting to feel good. You're going to feel good at that point. So you just need to get to that point. You know, it, it takes time. It takes consistency, but your genetic potential is going to be hard to hit. You just need to get to that point. And that's but. like another thing, like genetic potential is the mac like the highest and maximum point you can achieve naturally. So when people talk about, you know, what they genetically are predisposed to and what they can actually reach, that should be what you're striving to achieve. Like, it's not something that like a year from now you're going to be able to hit. Like it's something that is good. <laughs> it's like the highest and most hardest achievable point you can reach. It should not be something that comes easily. Like uh, I saw this um, video about, uh, I forget what the kid's name is, but it's the kid that was, paired up with Andrew Tate for a while. Um, there's some streamer kid and he asked Tate, he's like, oh, Aiden what? Ross, that one. Yeah. 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 Um, and he goes like, what, what's the quickest and easiest way to get abs? And Tate just responds with, you know, why should it be easy? Like, why, yeah. why are you looking for a quick answer here? And like, when it comes to the genetic, you know, potential that you're going towards, like it, the, any calculators you can find or anything like that, where it tells you hypothetically what you could reach, that should be what you, achieve in your best like absolute self it's not something that can happen overnight you have to really grind for it and that's something that you know people don't want to do hard work anymore so when they're in the gym they'll probably do what they want to be doing and they won't push themselves to failure they won't push themselves into the pain barrier they won't push themselves where they need to be doing or where they need to be going in order to achieve this, this like potential, what we're talking about here. Yeah. And when, if you talk to anybody who really knows the hell they're talking about too, something that they're going to say, especially when it comes to anabolics is um, you need to be training twice as hard or working twice as hard on anabolics as you were not on them, which kind of sounds like it's reverse psychology, but it's not. 
Uh, you're gonna be your body is gonna be putting getting put through a lot, and your body's gonna want to train hard. Um, it's gonna want to recover from that, and that's what the anabolics do. really, really the really ultimately what anabolics does at the end of the day is it makes your body recover better, um, faster and better. So you need to train twice as hard to really take advantage of that. Otherwise, you're just wasting away your health. Um, that's why it seems like reverse psychology is that you can still train just as usual on anabolics and make crazy gains, but you're not reaching the full potential of your, of your cycle. So why would you even bother? You know, why are you going to take anabolics and then just half-ass the gym because, oh, I'm making better gains than usual. So I might as well not try that hard. It's like, no, you should really be trying hard because you're, you're already putting your body in that place where it is damaging to your organs. So why not really take as much advantage of it as you can? What you're you know. telling me that when people hop on anabolics, you don't have to just stop going to the gym. You you can just you can just you just you just pin and you don't actually work out anymore. <laughs> there's been there's been times where like there was a study, I think we talked didn't we talk about that study once? The the four double so. blind study. Okay, so there's a double blind study done with I think it was Anadrol. I believe, which is on the harsher side. Let me see if I can find that, find the study. So anadrol is, um, is a very, is one of the harsher, um, uh, anabolics you could take out there. Um, let me see, see if I can find this study. Yeah, it's not really, I can't really find it, but, um, I'd have to, I'd have to really do some research to find it. I, I, I would have come prepped today if I knew we were going to be talking about this, but basically what ended up happening was, um, was that, sorry, I'm getting a phone call. Jeez. Can you shut up? <laughs> Anyways? Um, sorry about that. So basically what ended up happening was they took four groups of people, right? And it was a double blind experiment. So nobody knew if it was going to be placebo or not. Um, but everybody thought that they're taking anadrol, right? So you had four groups, one group that, was natural going to the gym one group that was natural and not going to the gym one group that was taking anadrol and going to the gym and one group that was taking anadrol and not going to the gym by the gym i mean like lifting properly staying consistent yeah. with food and stuff like that they're all doing that so the person who the the group of people that went to the gym naturally gained like half the muscle that the people with anadrol didn't go to the gym with. So like, let's say like it was like 10 pounds, for instance, right? The people who went to the gym naturally gained five pounds while the people who didn't go to the gym, but took anadrol gained 10 pounds of muscle. Like even when you're not going to the gym, you actually gain more muscle than you do naturally going to the gym, at least according to this study. Um, it was a pretty small study and, and it lasted, I think it was like 12 weeks or something. Uh, and it was just one study that was done. So it's not like you should really take it, you know, you should take it with a grain of salt a pretty big grain of salt. Um, but it's, it does happen. And there's been like Reddit stories and stuff where this guy, there's a story where this guy just played video games all day and did nothing at home and was taking trend. He decided to hop on trend <laughs> and he got like abs, like, <laughs> that's, like he lost fat and gained abs. Like, it's like, he was just like, eh, fuck it. I'm gonna take trend and just like <laughs> took a cycle of trend and just got like crazy looking. Um, you know, what always, what always surprises me is that people know about, or at least if you name drop some different anabolics, some people like actually know about it, even though they have absolutely no reason for me to be knowing it. Like this guy you're talking about, like that just is at home, like doing whatever, like he has no reason yeah. to know what any of these things are. <laughs> yeah. He, he, yeah, they had, they had no idea. Um, and most people can even name like the actual scientific name of these drugs. You'd be like, Oh, it's trenbolone. <laughs> No, no, no. It's okay. steroids. But what's, yeah, it's a <laughs> uh, uh, muscle juice, dude. Like it's not, yeah, it's most people can't even name the actual name. And they'd be like, like people would be like, oh, it's, I'm taking D-ball. But it's like, okay, what's the actual name for D-ball? Or like, oh, well, uh, Jay Cutler only ever took tests and EQ on his growth cycle. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. It's like, okay, well, first. That's Jay Cutler, and EQ doesn't agree with every, everybody. But if you can't even like at least name the scientific name to look, oh, uh, it's equipoise. Okay, but what is the scientific name? What is the actual yeah. name for it? Equipoise is just a term, and they can't name it. But it's like like anadrol is oxymethylone, 
like that's the actual name. Uh, Primo is um, bol- um, so EQ is boldenone unde- undesiclinate, right? But uh, EQ is uh, or not EQ. Primo is Primo Bolin. It's um, however you wanted to pronounce it. I just say Primo. It's Primo Bolin essentially. Um, let me look up the. Well, I'm falling on my own fucking word. Um, let me look up. Primo I was gonna Bolin, say roasts other Primo people Bolin, for can't but... pronouncing it, and then <laughs> stumbles over. Metanolone and inthate. It's it's Primo Bolin is one scientific term for it, which is why it's called Primo. But metanolone and inthate. Or methanolone and inthate. It just depends on whoever you get it from. Um, but there's also different esters too. That's the other thing you got you got to talk about too. Is that people are like, "Well, I'm taking test E," like or like they want to hop on test E, and it's like, "Okay, do you know that how long the ester is or how long the half life is?" And they'd be like, "Well, I mean, I just know this is what everybody takes." It's like, "Oh, not everybody takes that." I know plenty <laughs> of guys on test SIP. I know plenty of guys on test prop. Uh, so, I mean, you can even take a combination of test E and test prop. So like, there's a lot that goes into it. So like, even though it's like test is one of the drugs, there's going to be test and inthate, which has, uh, like a kind of like a middle ground half-life test prop, which is a very fast half-life, you know, it's, it could be out of your system in a few hours, essentially. Um, and then there's test, test sip, which is like a really long half-life and it's in your system for weeks. So it just depends on what you're trying to go for, you know, uh, methanolone inthate, there's also acetate. Acetate is another one. Um, so trenbolone acetate is the actual term for it. Um, let me look up the half-life. So typically people think trenbolone acetate. There's also inenthate. You know, there's different. It's what it's bound, bonded to. Um, let me see if I can find the half-life for it. Um, yeah, so like that's something you got to take into account when – like that's why I always say – okay, so – Trenbolone acetate has a half-life of about three days. So what a half-life is, right? So when you're talking about half-life, um, the ester is essentially the second word, essentially, right? So acetate is the ester. Um, so when you're talking about the length of the ester, how long the ester is, or the half-life, essentially what that means is, let's say you take a dose of trenbolone, like 300 milligrams or something. Your half-life means in three days, that trenbolone is now 150 milligrams in your system. It's half yeah. of it's gone. Half of it's used up. So then after that, another three days means 75 milligrams is left. So every three days, 50% of whatever is in your system is gone. That's what a half-life is. So like that's why when you have a longer half-life, it takes forever for shit to come out of your system because like let's say the half-life is two weeks. Two weeks is like let's say 500 milligrams just to, just to make it easy. In two weeks, you're going to have 250 milligrams. Two more weeks, you have 125. Two more weeks, you have 67.5. It just – it takes so long for it to come out of your system um, where with like a, like a shorter ester, it'll be like, like, let's say like a day, like one day is the half-life. Then a second day is another 50% gone. A third day is another 50% gone. So like guys who compete naturally in quotations, naturally, some of them cheat the system by ha- taking a very, very short half-life anabolic and that like, it filters out. Yeah. Yeah, they filter it out long before the, the the actual test is to see if they're taking anything, anything, and there's they can't detect anything. And even then, they would just take like test maybe, maybe a DHT, and then they just have it drop out of their system, you know, long before whatever their test is going to be. But um, you know, that's why like you got to take natural bodybuilding with a grain of salt because I know someone off the top of my head right now, I have him blocked in Instagram because he's so fucking toxic because he's like talking about how it takes dedication blah blah blah, to compete naturally whatnot it's like dude you're so far beyond everybody else like you're clearly not fucking natural like he looks like he's on anabolics on a natural stage (sighs) not even compared to natural competitors i just mean like just if you take him and just cut him out i'd be like yeah he's on gear not even looking at to comparisons you know what i mean so like that's how people treat the system so there's there's so many different branches of shit that come off of all these different drugs that people don't realize um and all these different like different versions of shit too like you know whether or not you should be injecting or if you should be taking an an oral or something like that you know is is also going to play a role because orals are heavier on your liver they're they're more toxic to your liver but sometimes orals are very uh beneficial to what you're trying to do like you know nfr is a good oral that a lot of people use but you wouldn't really necessarily inject nfr typically you take the oral but then like um like DECA, I'm pretty sure DECA has 
oral versions of it, but you want to inject it because it just, your body is going to respond better to it. And it's not so harsh on your liver. So there's so much shit that goes into all this that saying, Oh, I want to do a t- dose of TRT or hop on trend. It's like, dude, you have no, no fucking clue what you're talking about. Hmm. Like, okay, what even, what is trend? What's the derivative? They can even tell you that it's an alpha nine nor that's what it is. Like you can't, it's just the the lack of knowledge of these kids right in their own cycles and bro science and bullshit. It's like, dude, you have no fucking clue what you're talking about. Like when I first started taking anabolics, I trusted my coach, but I also kind of like you started knew going to learn into it that I can trust yeah. him. Yeah, of course. Of course. Which most people won't even do. Most pros don't know what the fuck they're talking about, which is sad. Most, most pros don't know why they're eating what food they're eating or what anabolics they're taking. Like they have no yeah. idea what the fuck they're talking about, which is sad. But like I knew like, okay, my, like my coach didn't want to put me on drugs right away. And even then my first cycle wasn't like ridiculous. It's not like he's putting me on two grams of shit. Like that also played a role into whether or not like what I accepted, like I wanted to work with him and he wanted to work with me, but I knew going into that. If he was like, let's put you on shit now. Or like when we were to start a cycle, if he was going to put me on anything more than like a gram then I'm like, okay, this is not good. Like this is, that's something you need to, keep an eye out for and any good coach will trash on coaches that will put their guys on shit right away because they yeah. have no idea how their body's going to respond to anything let alone food like respond to even anabolics before they put them on anything you can kind of guess how people are going to respond to things after working with them for a while if you're a good coach but if you don't even know how their body responds to fucking chicken versus beef you they should not be telling you what to fucking take um granted there are prep coaches um you know there are coaches that that do like you know, they'll do like prep cycles for people and they'll be like, okay, what's your food at right now? What's your results? What anabolics have you taken? What was your results from that? You know, there's a whole lengthy process to even get started, but then they'll just kind of give them guidance going through their prep to their show. And then they'll give them a PCT and then they're done with them. Essentially. That's sometimes what happens. A lot of coaches won't do that, but um, that does happen sometimes because a lot of, a lot of athletes who are very, very experienced, for instance, like CBUM, he could probably do his own like off season and post cycle therapy and all of that. But like his prep is really where Milos comes in. You know, prep is really where like these, these top notch bodybuilders really get, or not bodybuilders, bodybuilding coaches really get these guys to the next level. Um, you know, getting them peeled and lean and properly training and all of that. So um, there's a lot that well, goes think, into it and all these guys. Uh-huh. I was going to say, I think also when you get to that point where you're competing at the O or like the Arnold or something like that, you don't want that added stress of having to worry about that yourself. You just want to let someone else take care of it for yeah. you. So while you learn about it yourself and you take care of it yourself and all other aspects of your life during that one particular stretch of time, you don't want to have to deal with it yourself. So that's kind of where the yeah. coach really steps in and becomes such a critical piece of the program. Yeah. And at the same time, you're going to be your own harshest critic. So like, wh- I don't know what my coach sees when I send him my weigh-ins, but if I were to see my weigh-ins, I would be very unhappy, but like, he knows what he's doing. So for me, I'm like, oh man, I'm losing my abs a little bit. I'm, I'm gaining strength and gaining size. Granted, I'm getting bigger, but I'm also losing, or like I'm getting a lot of fat in certain areas. Um, but he's like, he'll tell me like, dude, just trust the process. You're making the gains that we want you to make. You're going in the direction we want you to go in. But like, to me, it's like, this sucks. I hate this. I hate the way I look, but he's like, trust the process. This is what I want you to look like. This is what was supposed to happen. So that's the other thing that coaches do too, is that like, if you write your own cycles or do your own shit, most guys will only ever want to be lean. Like that, it's just bias. You're just going to be biased towards wanting to have six pack abs. But part of the process is getting to the point where you're not happy with how you look. You know, it's part of it. You're going to be unhappy with it. And it just, it's, it's, it can be dangerous if you're own, your own coach. I mean, it, like I said, if you know what you're talking about, so Sebum is, you know, an exception to it because he probably knows what he's talking about. But most guys can't do their own off site, off season cycle because they're just, or off season plan even because they're going to want to look good, you know, year round. And that's just hard to do. Um, yeah. so it's, it's, it's difficult, man. It just sucks. It sucks seeing that, you know, seeing these guys being like, oh, I want to hop on TRT. Like Alex Eubanks recently said that and it went viral because he's like, oh, I just want to hop on TRT. And all of a sudden all these other kids who follow him are like, yeah, maybe I should do the same thing if he's doing it. And it's like, that's not, it just, that's just where it starts. It, yep. It's just, it, it's, 
you know, it's, it's like, it's like regular drugs. I was just going to say that? it's a rabbit hole where you just get, you know, you, you start and then it so you start just going down the deep, deep dive of things. Like there's no, there's no Absolutely. way to regulate it if you don't have someone helping you with it. Right, right. And it, it's like regular drugs. It's like you can't just be like, oh, just this one time I'm going to I'm going to snort this Coke. It's like you can't like you almost never does it just start like almost never is it just like just this. You know what I mean? Like it usually is a snowball, you know, something like that. It's same with anabolics. It's a snowball. And I mean, it sucks that the, like I get why this shit's illegal, but there is a reason it's illegal and it's because it is addictive. So being on TRT, like you know, I've been on TRT plenty of times, you know, I've been on cruises plenty of times and it can be in a, in a sense addicting because it, you feel much better on TRT than you do not on it. So it, it's like, a, like we were saying earlier, it's going to snowball. So you just really need to take that with a grain of salt. And at the same time, you know, we, we talk about this because we want you, you guys to be informed, but like, you really shouldn't be thinking about this if you've been in the gym for less than probably like two years, at least at minimum two years. Um, and even then you shouldn't really be thinking about it if you're under probably 20, even, even 21, 22 for that matter. Um, it, That's another not, thing. Age, yeah. age is so, like males are going to continue to be, well, a male peak form is like 30. <laughs> yeah. 20, yep. 29, 30, 31. Like that is yeah. peak. And when people like, Paul and I are both mid twenties right now. Like if, if people our age were like, Oh, this is frustrating. I'm not getting anywhere. I'm like, bro, you're not even at your peak. You're, <laughs> you're not even yeah. where you're going to be like, you, like your, your maximum like area of growth. You're not even there yet. Just and you're not even <laughs> legally an adult yet. <laughs> <laughs> you just need patience. Patience is so critical in this. Yeah. And a lot of time when you're younger, you're just building superficial muscle. None of it's dense. None of this shit's going to stay. If I stop lifting, this shit probably won't stay. This shit will deteriorate over time. It's not really that dense. You really start building dense muscle like post 26, 27. Um, and even then, ideally, you don't want to take anything before like probably 25. Like you want your brain to fully develop before you take anything, ideally. Um, obviously, bodybuilding is a different world. But if you're just doing lifestyle stuff, you shouldn't be taking anything anyways. But if you can avoid it when with bodybuilding as long as you can then do that you know go as far as you can without it to the point where it's like all right if i really want to make pro i need to i need to start it now and even even then you need to be working with a coach for an extended period of time you need to have those expectations set you need to be at the point where you guys know exactly how your body's going to respond to everything and even then like if you plan on it, like this is the other thing too with bodybuilders is they expect to start working with a coach and then like six months later, hit a show and do well. I mean, it's like, dude, you're going to get fucking wrecked like that. You're, you're like, saying I'm not going to win the O a month after I start a cycle. <laughs> yeah. I start with my coach in September. So you think I'm going to win the O in December? Um, <laughs> yeah, no, that's not how it's, how it works. It's, it's, you, you it's going to take a long time. And a lot of the time, if you're like, like for me, for instance, I wanted to hit a show within probably a year after I started with my coach. And we're coming up on, or just about two and a half years and haven't hit one. So we're supposed, my first show was supposed to be January, 2022. That was my first show. Yeah. Supposed, supposed to be, but we kept pushing it to get my body to the best place possible where it's like, I could even potentially step on a national stage if I do well with the regional, um, mm-hmm. you know, using the regional to kind of hopefully gauge where I am nationally. You know, obviously, if I were to get my pro card, I'm not competing at a pro level, but like that's a big goal of mine is to get my pro card. Really, I just want to lose my baby fat. But, um, you know, we, we've been pushing it for over a year now. It's going to be a year and a half. We keep pushing it back. But now it's like my coach is like, we're going to do it this summer. This is this is the time we're doing it. Um, and so you're just you got to you got to understand that like it's going to take time with your coach. If your coach is a good coach, he's not going to put you on stage pretty soon. And for anybody who's been to a regional show, you can tell right away when someone's ready versus when somebody's not ready. It's really obvious. Um, and it's 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 I feel bad sometimes seeing it at a regional show because it's like, why did you bother stepping on stage? And you probably did a water cut and shit and like really pushed your body to the point where like you really shouldn't have. And you're going to get like, and they get like fifth in like their class. And there's only five people competing in their class. Like that sucks. Like, yeah. But, 
but you need to under, like i think it's also good to to see that like if you plan on competing go to some regional shows and see what the competition kind of looks like and kind of what your expectations are because we only ever see the best of the best but if you want to see really what bodybuilding actually looks like go to a regional show trust me yeah <laughs> trust me go to a regional show it, it will shock you it will shock you um so that'll make you feel better about yourself too because people set this unrealistic expectation to look like sebum well yeah because that's all like they see banks yeah like the top 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 guys it's like saying it's like working a regular job and being like why am i not jeff bezos yet like that's literally <laughs> what it is like like dude you just like you're just starting out you're fine like well i'm not at elon musk level i need to keep taking anabolics or whatever you want like, to most- get to that level <laughs> You want to most see? You want to know the most common example of this that I see? It's the uh, <laughs> it's when people are in the middle of a leg day, and they go to do a flex and they do a quad stomp because <laughs> <laughs> because they see they see the videos of Jay Cutler just mesmerizing a crowd with his with his quad stomp, and like everyone else on that same stage was like flexing their quad, but they don't do a quad stomp like that. <laughs> yeah. That was, so you just yeah. see people at the gym and they're like, you know, watch this shakes their leg, heel out stomp. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, he was, uh, he was unique with that stomp there. And even then that, that stomp is a very unesthetic pose, but that's, what's also kind of iconic is that he looks fucking enormous in it. Yeah. Like that's, that's why it's so iconic, but yeah, you're right. It's like, people do these poses that don't make them look good. And like, that's what that, that's what Steve Weinberger was doing at that seminar was like, he was tearing people apart for not looking good in poses. You need to do what makes you look good. And almost never does anybody look good in this quad stop. You know what I mean? <laughs> so just do what looks good for you. Um, but yeah, it's like people try to do all the C bum poses and shit, but he does what looks good for him. He can't yep. pose like Urs. He can't pose like Ramon because that's what looks good for them. He does what looks good for him. Uh, so you gotta, you gotta understand that, you know, you imagine it, that. It, imagine it's not a cookie cutter template. Like what? <laughs> what? Oh my gosh. Every single pose doesn't look good on everybody. Are you kidding me? What? Yeah. That's a wild that's, concept. <laughs> oh my gosh. Are you kidding me, dude? That's, that's so crazy. No, but it, that goes for training and food and everything too. It's, it's all different for everybody. Um, yeah, I, I wish I could fucking eat like Seabum, dude. He gets like, what, like two subway subs every week at like for his cheat meal or something that's like, what i've fuck. been doing actually not not I because wish. not because he's doing it but just because <clears throat> it's the only clean uh go out to eat option in the area really yeah so i mean it's relatively clean um yeah well it depends what you order to too you can't just go in there and be like give me everything <laughs> yeah you can be healthy at at um at subway definitely avoid the tuna Tuna's yep. not actually tuna. Ten, it's like ten percent tuna or some shit. Yeah, it's um, like all mayonnaise. Yeah, but even then, the actual meat's not like actually tuna. Um, yeah. But yeah, you can be healthy with that. I think Chipotle is like one of the top like, like this is like the ref- like if you're gonna cheat on your plan, Chipotle yep. is probably the way to go. Um, Chipotle or like Qdoba or something like that, like rice and chicken. Um, like I'll get when or like you could do like a chicken breast salad. But anyways, that's. We're kind of getting off topic there. But <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, oh my gosh, it's not like, and then the other thing too, with like anabolics too, is that everybody thinks, oh, this cycle works for everybody. There is no cycle that's going to be cookie cutter. Like what works for me is not going to work for somebody else, you know, and what works for them is not going to work for me. Um, like I don't need to take much of an AI really, but I need to take a because I put on prolactin like a motherfucker. Not everybody does that. You know, it's, you got to adjust accordingly. Um, and when you're taking anabolics too, you gotta you gotta get blood work done. You need to you need to uh, take into account what food you're eating because like you can't have alcohol because alcohol is gonna affect your hormone levels. Um, you know, there's gonna be all these different kinds of things that are gonna play a role, and it's there's a lot more to it. It's not just simply taking a drug and then stop taking it because if you stop taking it, you're gonna fuck your whole system. Yeah. You gotta take a PCT, which takes four weeks, and you gotta take HCG or Clomid or um, something like that. And then you gotta, you gotta get backwater. People can't even tell me what backwater is BAC water. And they're going to tell me that they're going to hop on a cycle of trend. Like <laughs> is it, isn't backwater when you gurgle water and spit it back out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what backwater is. 
but it's like <laughs> I have back one in my fridge right now because you never know when I'm going to need to hop on a PCT. But I mean, it's a lot of stuff you can kind of get for cheap. Like backwater is um, bacteriostatic water, um, which is what backwater is, BAC water. Um, it's basically just like extremely, extremely sterile water. Um, there's no bacteria in it whatsoever. Um, and then you mix it with a powder that you then inject most likely subcutaneous. Oh, there we go. There's another one. People can even tell me what fucking injection sites they're going to use and what type of pinning they're going to do, let alone if they even know what pinning means. <laughs> mm. Like they're like, like, I'd be like, uh, you're going to do intramuscular. You're going to do sub Q and people are like, what's sub Q subcutaneous. What's that in your fat? Oh, maybe I'll do that. You shouldn't. <laughs> you shouldn't be doing that. And then like, be like, oh, where are you pinning? Um, I don't know, my quad. Like, it's like, you got it. Like, there's so much to it. You can't just be like. Into my heart. <laughs> straight through my chest into my heart, dude. And then it's like, you don't want to hit your veins. You don't want to, like, there's just so, so much that goes into it. And then SARMs will fuck you up too. Just ignore SARMs. Act SARM like SARMs goblins. Don't exist. Yeah, don't even, don't even act like SARMs exist, guys, please um because songs we have no idea what's going to happen with them we have no idea um how they affect your body there's just so much to it so please just don't even act like songs are real um yeah they will fuck you up um <laughs> but yeah it's they can be dangerous i mean the only sarm i will ever preach is um um fucking carterin that's the only one i'll ever preach because well, songs are actually the SARMs are one of the easier ones to pick up, like in person too, which makes it yeah. more likely for people, like especially younger people, to hop on them. And then it's like, well, hey, you just kind of wrecked your system. You look like crap. Congrats. <laughs> right, right, right. And it is easy to get, and like, it's you can order it online, like no problem. Like there's yeah. there's so many websites that sell it, and it's under this like gray umbrella of like like for research only in quotations. Um, even though you're not, yeah, uh, only acquired like this website that I buy that, or not I buy, but you can buy anabolics from not anabolics, fucking SARMs, um, like Carter for instance, um, it says only acquired for animal research purposes. So like, I am an animal. It. Yeah. You're <laughs> buying it. Yeah. Technically, technically we are. So it's fine. It's fine. I'm researching on myself. Um, so like technically you can buy it and agree be like, yeah, I'm just going to give this to my cows so that I get more meat or something for the season yeah um, and then they go don't you live in new york city where's your cow <laughs> uh it's like a it's like a uh what's it oh, shit what's the movie called really why am i drawing um blade runner it's a blade runner situation where i have a virtual animal yeah <laughs> but i'm injecting real drugs <laughs> yes yes i'm just dropping it into the screen and it just falls to the floor <laughs> Um, yeah, no, it's, that's just, you gotta be careful SARMs because we don't actually know the long-term effects of them. Um, so we have no idea what Austin's going to do or rad 140 or anything like that. LGD as well. LGD has gotten fucking expensive. Jeez. $70 for 30 milliliters. Damn. That shit got expensive. Um, rad 140 will fuck you up that you'll put on so much weight with rad 140, just so much fat. And then also too, if you're, if you take SARMs, like you're going to screw yourself over because SARMs shut down your testosterone production pretty much. Yep. So you're going to feel like shit. And people are like, why do I feel like shit on SARMs? Because you have no test, bro. You shut it down. <laughs> you shut it down. You're taking an oral that essentially shut it down. So now you feel like shit and your, your fucking sex drive is through the, is in the garbage. Like you're fucked. You, now you got to take TRT. <laughs> El bozo. <laughs> What's that? El bozos. <laughs> yeah, Exactly. Um, but yeah, no, there's, there's so much shit that goes into it, but really at the end of the day, ge knowing your genetic potential is going to be first and foremost, and most likely you're not going to be able to reach your genetic potential on your own. That's where a coach is going to help come in. Yeah. Like a, a lot of that discipline and, you know, responsibility is taken away when you have someone who's checking in and saying like, all right, you fucked up. Like it's time to re-engage this particular part of the plan. Like you... If you're doing it by yourself and you mess up and like, let's say you do one cheat meal on your, on your diet and you're working by yourself, that one cheat meal will turn into two next week and then it eventually get worse and worse. And then you're just completely off the diet plan. And right. when you don't have someone working with you, 
um, it's easy to fall off. But that's why just picking somebody up and explaining to them like what your goal is. And everybody should focus on reaching genetic potential before they set other goals as well, because you want to, you know, prime your body in a, in a way that if you do progress into a further stage, you're able to do it in a healthy uh, manner. Like you don't want to just hop on a cycle when you're, you know, (laughs) 20% body fat and you're just, you know, hanging out. You want to, you want to be able to do it when your body is primed and, and in position to take it to that level in a very productive manner. Yeah, make it actually worth your while. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, it's it's so it's we're in a tough industry, man. This this it's tough. It, it's it's the only industry really where anabolics is kind of like normalized at this point. Like I remember, like Lance Armstrong. Um, what was he taking? I gotta look it up again. Was it EOP? Steroids. <laughs> yeah, they were saying like Lance Armstrong. Um, like got destroyed basically epo he's taking epo blood transfusions testosterone and corticosteroids um let me see if i can find what exactly they said he was taking so he's doing blood doping um many drugs resemble the natural hormone cortisol okay so he was taking something that's like an artificial cortisol basically um basically so he was taking cortisone, um, the most common types. Of, so he was taking essentially cortisone um, to to decrease inflammation, including swelling and pain. It's really not the end of the world. Obviously, testosterone. Um, he was taking EPO, which um, so like he's not even like on a ton of shit. Exclusive provider. No, that's not it. <laughs> 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 it's, it's, it said exclusive provider organization. I was like, ah, oh, that's not an anabolic. <laughs> Goes in and starts buying it. <laughs> yeah, it's a peptide hormone. All right, that's that's so you inject EPO and it increases your red blood cells. So it's going to help with with blood flow and overall um, hemoglobin in your blood. Um, let me see. It's going to help with holding oxygen. Really, it's just going to help him hold more oxygen. So it's not even like he's taking a ton of shit, and yet it was like. It like ruined his career. Um, yeah. And it was just tiered to what he was doing too. Like that kind of stuff has no impact on a bodybuilding stage, you know, like that was just yeah. tiered towards what he was doing in the cycling world. Yeah. It was, it was all essentially blood doping besides, besides, um, besides the blood transfusions. Um, and well, obviously, tra- well, not that's kind of blood doping, but, um, st- uh, the testosterone he was taking wasn't, isn't blood doping, but like, that's the other gray area too, is that, a lot of organizations consider TRT as like taking anabolics, but it's like you can take a TRT that keeps you basically at the same level of testosterone as you would normally be. Um, and at a certain age, you, at a certain age, you just need to hop on it too, because you know, males naturally decline with their, you know, built in testosterone and what's naturally produced. So eventually it's just healthy to hop on TRT. Right. And when, when this came out, he was like, you guys really think I'm the only one taking this stuff? Yeah. Like, he's not alone. You know, it's not like he like, and that was like the only way he could really like, not really the only way, but like, that's really how he was able to help or get the win was because the, the people he's competing against are also taking the same shit, you know? So it's like, it's like trying to compete professionally in bodybuilding. Like you're almost never like in the history of men's open, even will there ever be a natural bodybuilder up there because you just you can't keep up there's no way you can be natural and compete on a men's open stage professionally yeah. let alone the o for instance but like professionally even get your pro card yeah good luck good luck getting <laughs> your pro card naturally um but yeah it's like it, it just and then <sighs> baseball is another one that that can kind of ruin your life if you if you find out they even find out you're on trt like it's fucked um which is but wild it, because most people in – and not just in baseball. We're talking like uh, major major sports in general. 90% of those people are on something because you see the recovery time on grew, just gruesome injuries, and that's where it's super clear. Like when yeah. someone bounces back from a blown Achilles in a month, you know something's up because, I mean, Achilles, you, you blow out your Achilles. That's, that's six months normally. 
Like, mm-hmm. you can't recover from that stuff that quick. And then they'll always be like, oh, well, it wasn't as it wasn't as severe as originally thought, which is just a line because it 100% is them just spiking something and getting themselves there through the means of if it's anabolics or some other kind of medically induced uh, supplement. Yeah. And there's there's also like Joe Rogan talked about it. There's also like different um, ways you can utilize the system. Yeah. Um, with injuries because like in MMA, for instance, the UFC allows for TRT dosage during injury recovery. So Mm -hmm. they're like, Oh, it's okay to run TRT if you're, you know, recovering from an injury. But like what they'll do is instead of running TRT, they just run a full test cycle and recover and then just utilize that test cycle to their best of their abilities and just become fucking crazy. Like that's what Conor McGregor did. He, I think he was healing from like a broken ankle or something. And he was on just like supposedly TRT, but then he came back looking fucking huge in comparison yeah. to what he used to look like. And it's just because he was utilizing the system. And that's just he how used it's to, like, it's. He used to fight mm-hmm. in the 140 ish division and man's clocking in at like 160, something like that. He's huge. Yeah. And he stayed pretty lean too. It's not like he just blew up at weight. Like from fat, he like gained a lot of muscle during that. Obviously not 20 pounds of muscle, maybe like five or six pounds at the most, but um, yeah. still like he stayed pretty lean for the most part. And, you know, that's what they utilize. But it's like, don't hate the player, hate the game. Like this is the system that they have in place. And if you're able to exploit it, then that's not against the rules. If it's not against the rules, then why not exploit it? Um just but, like I mean, by claiming that you're an animal and that when you buy these things for animal yeah. testing, I am the animal. <laughs> exactly. Don't hate the player, hate the game. Like if they're going to make this shit illegal <laughs> besides buying it for research, like you could just say you're buying it for research. They can't prove you wrong. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and like the FDA, this is also something that came up recently was the FDA proposed a new bill or something like that that basically made it so that um, you can't get prescriptions from telemedicine routes for schedule three through five drugs and trt is schedule three i think so yep. they're going to make it even harder to get um trt or any sort of hrt that you actually need through telemedicine routes and it's like you guys are so fucked up because they're like oh let's make it hard to get trt but like if you want to go from male to female that's or female to male that's not a problem we'll just you just dose some testosterone and estrogen yeah, and we, we talked shit. about that earlier too. Yeah. Not earlier, but earlier in the week because that's such a wild concept that, you know, someone who wants to tear their body for either bodybuilding or if it's just to progress themselves to a, you know, higher level utilizing external factors. And then someone who is just making a, you know, change in physical characteristic because that's how they feel. And one is okay and one is not okay. That's wild. Mm-hmm. Yeah. it's And then like, obviously, I mean, you don't see this with bodybuilding, but like men transition to women can just hop on estrogen. And it's like, you don't realize how f- messed, how f- like you're fucking your body up so bad. Like, oh, like they're building breast tissue. That's not breast tissue, bro. That's gyno. They're building gynoclamastia. That's a problem. Like, that's not a good thing. Those You're not just like gaining fat for like actual breasts you're just gaining gyno and now you have to wear a bra and you're gonna have to tape your shit because it hurts so bad like that's not a good thing um but it just it's so it's so backwards and it's just so upsetting because it's like you're gonna arrest people who like you arrested fucking ian vayer's wife which is sebum's sister i think um because she had some anabolics on her with a controlled drop they did a controlled package delivery and arrested her for accepting the package and you're going to arrest her because there's anabolics in there, but you're not going to like, God forbid people want to put their own life in danger by taking steroids. And yet yeah. people with people are high on heroin are driving around on the streets. Like <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's just wild to me. It's just, it's just wild. Um, same with like DUIs, like, like alcohol while driving, like that's so much more dangerous than me taking anabolics to compete on stage. Like that's, yeah. So it, it's just, it, we, we live in a twisted world, man. We live in a twisted world. And I don't know, it's tough. And the thing is, is that as progressive as, you know, the modern social climate is, it's progressive in the opposite direction of 
what we talk about here in terms of anabolics and whatnot, because progressive for most people when it comes to, because anabolics are drugs. So when people think drugs, they're like, how can we outlaw everyone to make it a safe world? Whereas, you know, people in, you know, when we talk about the bodybuilding situation, like people taking this, like you said, oh no, someone's going to risk their own health to do something like we're just trying to solve overpopulation. Come on, guys. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the more bodybuilders, the less kids. Yeah, for real. <laughs> um, but it's it's also so easy to get. Like, outlawing is not the, the solution to pretty much anything because they outlawed everything that I take, and yet yeah, I can still get it, no problem. Like, it's so easy to get. It's so yeah. unbelievably easy to get. Um, outlawing is not going to be. All you're going to do is just make it more dangerous because in a sense, I don't know where my shit's coming from in a sense, you know, but if I was able to go to a doctor's office or get a prescription or go to a pharmacy and buy it, or even over the counter and just go buy a test, at least I know it's like pharma grade test, you know, and it's like actual testosterone, you know, well, that's that, that also the risk. That's also the financial side of things. Like we see it in the opioid situation right now, like people, you, these are all things that can be like, obtained for pre prescription purposes and yet when people go to the street because it's not affordable it's you know fentanyl based and then we have yep. all these opioid based deaths and mm -hmm. it's just the market as well yeah it's just you're just making it more dangerous at the, at yeah. the end of the day you're making it more dangerous like I wouldn't even get into guns. I was going to say, oh, let me get it. Yeah, no, I'm not even getting done guns. That's, that has nothing to do with on our podcast, but um, yeah, when it comes to drugs, it's just like out, like really. And then they're like, Oh, the war on drugs. Like we've been like the DA has been losing that, that war for decades now. And it's all you're going to do by outlawing a new, another drug is just making people go to the streets for it. And that's why like, I support the legalization of weed like, do I think people should be smoking weed all the time? No, I don't think so. But do I think that it should be legal so that people can get it safely? Absolutely. I think you should be able to go to a dispensary and get properly grown and properly safe marijuana so that at least you know that it's that that you're getting proper shit. It's like imagine yeah. if we outlawed alcohol. You're gonna people are gonna start making alcohol in the fucking toilets. You saw what happened during prohibition. Yeah. Exactly. Like it's just people are going to go illegal routes to get it. That's all you're going to do. All you're doing is taking it away from people who are obeying the laws prior previously. That's all you're going to like. That's all you're going to do um, with outlawing anything. So and 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 that's the other frustrating thing. Like there have been way more deaths from like alcohol or prescription drugs than there has been from anabolics, for instance. Like so many more. Like yep. they even outlawed DMAA. The actual pre-workout supplement DMAA, they outlawed it and made it illegal to, to manufacture because like, I think like two or three people died from it. It's like, bro, the amount of people that die from like amphetamines from prescriptions is way more than a stimulant is. And even then to die from a stimulant, you have to take a shit ton, like absolute fucking massive amount. Or have other health, situ like health yeah. experiences. Yeah, like have actual heart issues prior to taking a ton, you know? Um, there has to be something underlying to it. And like to like to kill yourself with anabolics, it takes years. It takes years and years to get there. It happens absolutely and it's fucking sad and it's dangerous. It is one hundred percent dangerous. That's why you really need to know what you're the hell you're doing. But it's not like you take I mean, you can overdose probably on anything, any sort of anabolic, but like it's not like you're gonna take like one cycle and all of a sudden die three months later. It usually takes a long time to really get to the point where your body's going to die from it. Like you're going to die from yeah. anabolics. So um, it, it's it's not instantaneous where with like amphetamines or opioids, you can literally overdose by accident. People overdose by accident, um, taking too much than they need to be taking. Um, so it's we live in a we live in a messed up world, man. We live in a messed up world. But granted, we are also more free than pretty much any other country out there. We have more liberty than pretty much any other country out there. So, I mean, I'm not really complaining too much. Yeah. And another big part of it is just, you know, continuing to be the informed consumer, which is what, you know, goal of this podcast is. But in general, mm -hmm. just getting people to do their own research, which is ultimately how you solve this problem. Because if you get people actually understanding what's going into their body, instead of saying, oh, 
you know, for example, Eubanks, Eubanks says he's thinking about it. Therefore, I'm going to think about it. He Mm -hmm. is thinking about it because of very specific reasons. And he's done his own research, whereas you are doing it because you saw some bozo on the Internet talking about it. Like, Mm -hmm. just get some actual information and also (laughs) research articles are your friend and you need to learn how to read them. You should not be clicking on the news today article when it comes to talking about anabolics. You should be looking at, you know, scientifically backed research articles that are written by professionals in the field. That's the kind of information you want to be consuming. Because if you just read like CNN 10 on, (laughs) on anabolics, they're of course going to be telling you things that either support or, or, oppose your thought but they're not giving you the real scientific information which is what you should be kind of looking for yeah learn how to read a um scientific study i think that's important understanding statistics and being like okay what is the p level what's the confidence level you know how do they like what's a double blind experiment what's a blind experiment what's you know being able to understand what each of those are i think is important as well so that when you do read a study you know, we try to present the studies to you guys. You guys don't have to read it yourselves when we do have something to talk about, you know, like that study earlier today that I mentioned um, involving Anadrol. But um, on your own, if there's a study you want to read about, you need to be able to understand what you're reading. It's like a nutrition label. You need to learn how to read it first. Um, so that's important. And like there, like that article we were mentioning last episode where BuzzFeed was like, oh, weightlifters are eating dog food. It's like, no, we're not. You're making the uninformed. You're making the uninformed now misinformed. Bark, bark, bark. Yeah. It's like, dude, like it's not the reality. And, but like, there's a saying, was it Mark Twain? I think I said it. It was like, if you don't read the newspaper, you're uninformed. If you read the newspaper, you're misinformed. Yeah. Or something like that. And that's the reality that we live in today. It's like, if you don't research it, you don't know. But then if you... Or like not research it, but like if you don't watch the news or hear, listen from the news or social media or something like that, you won't know. But then when you do, you're now reading something wrong, you know, and that's kind of what's happening right now. It's like Trump indictment. Like nobody really knows what's actually going on besides the people involved in the case. There's also not a lot of public information when it comes to that. Right, right. So it's like we can only make like relatively informed guesses of what's going on you know from from our like from the public's understanding and from like a legal standpoint but even then you're going to get bias of people supporting or against trump you're going to get bias of people who don't like the the prosecutor so like it's there's just so much that goes into it there's so many fingers that end up touching these different cases that it's hard to understand really what's the truth behind it whether or not you know, for instance, he he committed the crimes that they're accusing him of. Only he knows or only the people involved really know. And that's yeah. part of, you know, that's part of any research that's part of any news article. And like social media is the same way. Only, like, you know, we can only speculate whether or not somebody's on something or or talk like like what the safety is behind something unless they say it themselves. You know, we can't speculate necessarily what Sebum is on unless he talks about it, you know, or like his coach knows, like only really them two know. Um, he does, he has talked about it in the past, but like his prep cycle and stuff like that, I don't think he's ever talked about, but and, only him and, and Milos talk about it or no. And I was going to say a good, a good coach will never release that information either. Right. You don't, you don't want that shit getting out. Um, it's, you don't like, like, I mean, I've heard what Nick Walker takes under Matt Jansen, but whether or not it's reputable, whether or not I even remember it properly is going to play a role as well in the information that's provided. You know, telephone, playing the game of telephone will affect the information that you're given. And that's also part of this podcast is we want to present it as unbiased as you possibly can. Um, So that way you're getting the information as raw as possible. We don't want to be like, oh, well, anything more than 300 milligrams of tests is just a waste of your time. I can't necessarily say that because everybody's different. And even though I'm on 250 right now for my cycle, doesn't necessarily mean that's a lot or not enough. Everybody's different. So I'm not going to put my bias in there. You know, this is just testosterone. It's just one anabolics people take, you know, that's just the reality. And however much you take is up to you. And however much your coach decides you take is up to him or her or whatever. So finding unbiased sources is very important when you're doing your own research. And almost always, if there is a scientific back study, 
with proper proper referencing and a proper statistical analysis is going to play a role. And even then, the first thing you should be looking at is the, the amount of test subjects. You know, they'd be like, oh, this is the results from test officer and you should be taking it, but we only tested on 10 people. It's like, does <laughs> do 10 people really necessarily represent the entirety of Earth's population? No. Yeah, your, so, your sample size is kind of biased. <laughs> exactly. Your sample size is not big enough to really represent a large population. Is it, does it give us maybe a rough idea of how something works? Sure. Maybe. If that, at best, it gives us a rough idea. But is it actually scientifically backed and properly studied? Not necessarily. And so, a lot of those tests also will repeat the test over and over and over again until they get the results they want. And then we'll toss out the other 99 tests that they, that they gave. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the problem. Like we were talking about that last episode. It's like, no matter what you research, you're going to find something that says you're going to die. Like <laughs> there's there, like you could research like the whole like thing with, um, with, uh, autism and, and vaccines. There was one doctor who said that, that like kids can get autism from vaccines and he had no, he had no backing behind it at all. It was like yeah. he just speculated it or something. And he's like, guys, I'm speculating here. Like this is like – like this is actually scientifically backed. And yet they they still take it as a science. You know what I mean? So it can be it can be dangerous what you're reading, you know? And we are back. Sorry, guys. I know for you guys it might sound like a second um, of a cut, but for us we had to uh, – create a new uh, recording session because we had some technical difficulties. So um, some just a second for you guys. Yep. Second for you guys, few minutes for us. So, um, but with that being said, um, we wanted to at least wrap it up nicely. Um, at the end of the day, you need to train to your proge- genetic potential before ever considering anything off market. Um, and how to look out for that is going to come down to your level of plateaus. Um, and obviously, if you have proper guidance, your coach will tell you that as well. Um, if you feel like you're not making any progress for five, six months, you've clearly kind of hit a plateau. You're obviously, shorter too, but um, you know you got to keep changing things up, and you're eventually going to get to the point where no matter what you do, you're not going to make much more gains, and that's your genetic potential. It takes a while to get there, but when you're there, you're going to know. You can tell, um, and then potentially, if you're if you have the proper guidance, that's when you start considering alternatives. So. Be careful out there and, you know, take social media with a giant bucket of salt. Yeah. And just be patient. That's really what it comes down to. Just patience and actually working your craft. Like just take your time, do it right. And don't jump on something just because you feel like you're not getting anywhere. Talk to someone first. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a marathon on a sprint guys. There's not going to be instant gratification. It's going to take time, but that's also part of the appeal. That's part of the flex, if you will. Is that exactly. it does take time to get all of this. So um, put in the time and you're going to you're gonna be glad that you did, you know, and enjoy the process. It's fun. Enjoy the process. Hell yeah, man. Yeah. All right, guys. With that until said, next week. Yeah, we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for listening. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys. Bye.